But I think one quality about Kwangold's music um, that, that strikes me is that all of his music to me sounds very honest. Uh, you know, it, it comes, like, it, it's a direct emotion that gets transported into your brain without anything to, to block it. Um, you know, it's 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 easy to make fun of the you know flourishes, I guess, that are that come with that kind of music. But I and it sometimes, as I told you earlier, it just makes me cry because it it's it's such a it's such an honest statement of emotions. There's there's nothing artificial about it. I think. Okay, so I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the score for. Uh, the Adventures of Robin Hood about its genesis because it's an interesting story and actually sort of a, a, a thriller almost. Because uh, what happened was that um, after the success of, of Captain Blood, uh, Warners offered um, the job to Korngold to score The Adventures of Robin Hood, which is going to be the next big movie. It started shooting in September of 1937. And Korngold, in theory, agreed, although he really wanted to return to Austria because he had just finished work on an opera called Die Katrin, which ended up being his last opera. And uh, so he wanted to finish orchestration on it, and he wanted to put together a premiere performance while in Vienna. So he, coordinate, he, tr he started coordinating um, with conductor and several singers that he had hoped would perform. And one by one, things just started going wrong. A singer had to drop out, he went off to the uh, Metropolitan Opera of all places, and uh, so he tried to put together some sort of compromised version of this, and in the middle of it uh, they received a cable from Warner Brothers saying, could you come to LA within two weeks, um, because we, we need to show you this uh, first assembly cut of Robin Hood. And Kongel turned to his wife and he said, maybe this is an omen, you know, maybe we should postpone this uh, opera premiere to later in the year. And uh, so the opera um, agreed with that and they said, we can, we can put together a first performance for you in October of 1938, when everybody he wanted to perform and conduct was available uh, and the schedules were, were, were okay with that. So Korngold booked his trip that very evening and he traveled with his wife and his younger son, George, um, because they thought, uh, since he had just been very ill, um, that you know the climate would be good for him, the California climate, as opposed to the rainy weather in, in Austria. And so the, the, the journey was a difficult one. Um, George writes that uh, the, just the, the, the journey across the ocean, there were a lot of storms. Nonetheless, uh, Eric Wolfgang Korngold was writing throughout the journey. He was sketching out ideas, themes um, for the movie. Uh, even though he hadn't seen it, he was, of course, familiar with the, the legend of Robin Hood. And uh, he did a little, a little bit of research at a library in Vienna regarding the subject. So he had some ideas. Uh, and also he made sure, because his father Julius had the idea, why don't you use this theme from this work called Suzum Corda, uh, which is a symphonic piece that he wrote that never was successful. And he's like, why don't you use that main theme as a theme for Robin Hood? And he's like, great idea. So, But he had to ask his publisher if it was okay to use that theme for this movie, and they agreed. So he had the okay for that. So he arrives in, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, actually, his, his train collided with a car, so he was a little bit shaken. Um, and he watches this movie. It, it was only the first half uh, of Robin Hood. And while watching it, he got increasingly nervous. And he left that screening thinking, I can't do this. I, I, I can't do this. This is an action movie. This, this is not the kind of drama that I was envisioning. It's like, you know, there's sword fights, sword fights all over the place. What am I going to do? So he panicked and he wrote this letter. And let's, let's look at this letter. Um, in which he basically says, I, 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 can't, I can't score this movie. He writes, uh, I have no relation to it and therefore cannot produce any music for it. I am a musician of the heart of passions and psychology. I'm not a musical illustrator for a 90% action picture. And then later on he writes, I implore you not to be angry with me and not to deprive me of your friendship. Uh, he wrote this to one of the producers of the movie. Uh, for it is I who suffers mentally and financially. So he had made this long trip to watch this movie and he, he, he felt he couldn't do it. So Warners had to accept that. But, and what happens from this moment on is, is could fill the pages of a World War II thriller. Because what happened was that um, while they were in, in LA, uh, they received a phone call from Korngold's wife's sister, 
who said that the Austrian chancellor at the time had a meeting with Adolf Hitler. And things were looking like Austria was going to join the Third Reich. Uh, so everybody was very, very concerned. And uh, so Krongold, his wife, and younger son were in L.A. His um, older son was still in Vienna because they thought, you know, he, he should stay there because of school. And, of course, his parents were still there. But his father, you know, thinking that things might take a very dark turn, had already secured a visa for himself and his wife, and they had a, a visa for their son. And they left on the last day that it was possible to do so without special permission. So they were able to leave Austria. And, but then the concern was, you know, what about all my manuscripts? Uh, because they're still in the apartment. So he called up, Krongold called his uh, publisher, and the publisher sent two of their employees to Krongold's residence. And when they arrived there, they saw that somebody had broken into it. Some Nazis had broken into it, and had taken a lot of the Korngold's belongings, and had thrown all the manuscript paper into a big uh, pile in the basement. And they were able to sneak in there and uh, steal, basically, um, almost all of Korngold's manuscripts. And then they were smuggled out of the country by the publisher, uh, by hiding the sheet music in between things that needed to be sent away. So that's how Korngold received his manuscripts, all those pieces that he had worked on as a kid. Um, and we now have, still have them. Uh, so that's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, and also, while, so with this, with this renewed energy, knowing that his family was going to be okay, his, his, his manuscripts were going to be okay, even though things were still very dark, and a lot of the Korngold families relatives and personal friends, they were committing suicide, they ended up in concentration camps, so that there, was, there was definitely a lot of despair. But he felt nonetheless inspired to write one of the most incredible pieces of film music ever. Um, and his son remembers that while he was trying to sleep in his room, he could hear his father through the wall exclaiming, I just cannot do this, I cannot finish this picture. Um, because he had six weeks to do it, and it's, it's like wall-to-wall -wall music throughout the whole thing. Um, so, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about his process, which was that, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't get timing notes from a music editor. So there was no, like, written list, you know, at this time, this and this happens. Instead, um, he was in, in, a, in a room with a projectionist, who would show him the footage over and over again. He would watch it and he would sing along with it or he would, he had an upright piano there and he would improvise and he would sketch something out and then in the evenings he would go home. Uh, it was a short walk, he was about 10 minutes away from Warner Brothers. Um, he had rented a house in Toluca Lake. And uh, so he, he would refine those sketches and then he would meet with his orchestrator, his lead orchestrator, Hugo Friedhofer, which who, as you know, later became a, a fantastic composer in his own right. Um, and they would go over the orchestration, and then Friedhofer would go off, and then the next day Korngold would go and watch some more footage and, and write music to it. And that's how it was done. Once the orchestrations came back to Korngold, he would look over everything, make last-minute corrections, and then it was recorded. And the recording, by the way, was uh, the favorite part for Korngold, as it is for most of us. You know, you, you see your work come to life, and Korngold felt very privileged that he was in a position where he would write a piece of music, and a, a few days later, you know, an orchestra would perform it, and it would get recorded. He thought that the music would live and die with the picture. So he thought that, you know, in the case of Adventures of Robin Hood, people would watch it when it came out, and then everybody would forget it, and his music would, would be dead. Of course, he was wrong, um, because we're still listening to it. It's being performed. And he, he prepared this concert suite, which we're going to look at, um, so his music definitely lives on.